This is lecture five. In this lecture, we'll be talking about the self. And the self is definitely a topic that's worth an entire lecture because we care so much about it. We are all pretty much obsessed with ourselves. So if you recognize this, then don't worry, you're not alone. Um, in this first part of the lecture, we'll be, we'll be talking about our self-concept and more about that uh, later. So in lecture three, uh, I hope you remember, we talked about how knowledge is structured in our brain and that certain topics are chronically activated because they are so important of, uh, to us. And the self is one of those topics that is chronically uh, activated. And uh, that has several interesting consequences. For example, the self-reference effect. The self-reference effect means that we have a very good uh, uh, mo uh, motivation. We are very motivated to learn about ourselves. And that also has implications for how our brain works. So um, we, uh, all the information that is relevant to the self is processed very efficiently and also remembered very well. So everything you learn about yourself, you have a very, very good memory for. And, and also uh, you, you pay a lot of attention uh, to it. So that's the self-reference effect. Our extra good memory and attention for all the information that's relevant for ourselves. And the second phenomenon, which I really think is very relatable to probably all of us, is the cocktail party effect. And the cocktail party effect is, I think I love the name because it's, uh, it's something that we've all been, been through, I guess. So let's uh, imagine that you're standing at a party it's pretty crowded and you're standing in a small group, you're discussing something, can be pretty much anything, you're paying attention, you're listening, you're responding to the people in your little group uh, where the conversation takes place. And then all of a sudden, in the conversation next to you, you hear your name. And even though you were not listening to that conversation at all, you were focused in, uh, focusing your attention to uh, the conversation in your own group, this immediately catches your attention. You hear your name and immediately you, your attention switches to the other conversation. You see that happening here uh, in the slide. So um, this is a phenomenon that occurs when uh, you immediately detect words uh, that are important to you uh, that actually uh, originate from an unattended stimuli. So something that you were not uh, previously paying attention to. Uh, and yeah, the name cocktail party effect really uh, is, is derived from the fact that we can experience this when we're at a busy party and you hear your name. Um, so we care a lot about ourselves. We have very good attention for all uh, information relevant to the self. And yeah, we remember this very, very well. Um, at the same time, we also mistakenly think that others share this fascination for us. So we think that people are also focusing their attention on us all the time as well. And we have this especially when something is a bit off. So let's imagine you have a bad hair day, you feel very self-conscious about something in your appearance, for example, your hair, or maybe some, you have a, um, a, a zit on your face, or you have something that makes you feel very subconscious and, and very, very uh, self-aware, um, then you feel like everybody is looking at you. This is called the spotlight effect. You feel like you're in the spotlight and everybody's looking at you and everybody's maybe even ridiculing you because of the way uh, of how you look. But actually, people are not so much paying attention to you. Uh, we overestimate uh, the, the idea that how much people focus our, their attention on us. Um, because you have to remember that everybody is mostly focused their attention on themselves. So they are not really paying attention to you so much, or at least not as much as you think, or afraid of, uh, because people are also preoccupied with themselves. So that might be a reassurance uh, sometimes. Um, so we have a lot of attention for ourselves, but... If we focus on ourselves, what do we see? Well, what we see is our self-concept. That is the overall set of beliefs that people have about their own personal attributes. Your view of who you are, your answer to the question, who are you? So let's imagine I ask you that question. Describe yourself for me. What do you know about yourself? How would you describe yourself? Then you might think to yourself, well, I am a pretty smart person. I care a lot about the people around me, I am honest, and I'm also a bit lazy. So you could come up with a description that looks like this, describing your personal unique characteristics. But you can also answer this question differently. You might also say, well, I am a daughter of my parents, I am also a good friend, uh, I uh, am an ice skater, that's my hobby, that's what I do, and I'm a student. So these are two very different answers to the same question, and both are correct. 
And that is because we have um, different ways of describing ourselves, different types of identities, uh, as you wish. So first of all, we have our personal identity, and that is how you think about your own unique personality and your own qualities. That, so that will be describing yourself as smart and caring and honest, lazy. Those are all your personal characteristics, part of your personal identity. But we also have an identity that relates to others. First of all, we have a relational identity, and that is how you feel about yourself in relationship to the people around you. So, for example, to the people that are close to you, like your friends. What kind of friend are you? Uh, are you the one that makes everyone laugh all the time? How are, how are you uh, when it comes to uh, relating to your family? Are you very active? Are you maybe more a wallflower, more in the background? So how would you describe yourself in relationship to others? Uh, then finally, we also have a social identity. And that is how we feel about ourselves in relation to uh, groups that we belong to. So, for example, you are part of the group of students. And that is also part of your identity. Um, and social identity is actually a very important topic that we'll come back to uh, at the very end of this course in uh, lecture 13. So we have these different uh, identities. And it's important to realize that culture plays an important role when it comes to how people view themselves. There's a lot of differences between cultures in how they relate to others. And I think you've all, uh, you're all familiar with uh, the difference between individualistic cultures and more collectivistic, collectivistic cultures. And these two types of cultures uh, also have a different way of, of seeing themselves, their relationship their relationships to others. So if you are living in an individualistic culture, the Netherlands is a pretty individualistic country, so if you're from here, then uh, chances are that you are also uh, have an individualistic culture, uh, then you probably see yourselves as pretty much independent of others. We see the bonds that we have with others are as more or less voluntary, something that we choose to, uh, to have or maintain. Of course, our bonds with family members is not voluntary. That's something that we're pretty much stuck with. But even when it comes to family, we can make a choice to either um, have a close relationship with the family or a distant relationship. That's something that we can, we can decide. So we have an independent self, an independent view of who we are. Uh, this is in contrast uh, to people from collectivistic countries. They have a more interdependent self, and that means that they see themselves as part of a social uh, group. So um, they, uh, have, uh, they see the, the ties that they have to others not as voluntary, that's fixed, that's something that's part of who they are. They would never even consider leaving that group because that, that's just such a big part of their social identity. And if you're from an individualistic culture and you're describing yourself, chances are that you describe your personal identity as most important. So if I ask you a question, if you're from an individualistic culture, describe yourself, you'll probably come up with aspects of your own unique uh, personal characteristics. So the first uh, reply from the girl that we saw on the screen. Uh, and if you're from a collectivistic country with an interdependent self, then uh, your relational and your social identity are way more important. So if you ask people from those uh, cultures to describe themselves, they will probably refer to the relationships they have with others, like family members or bigger social groups. Um, so to get a sense of, of where people, uh, uh, where the individualistic cultures and the collectivist cultures are in the world, here you see a map of the world, and the darker uh, red uh, areas are more collectivistic countries. So you see in East Asia is pretty much known for being very collectivistic, but also in parts of South Africa and South America, uh, collectivistic cultures are uh, predominant. But also within Europe, and a lot of people don't realize this, there are differences between uh, how people see themselves and the culture that they have. So here you see a map of Europe. Again, the red areas are more collectivistic uh, areas. And you see that in the south of Europe and in the east of Europe, uh, the, the culture is more, uh, more collectivistic. And in the darker uh, um, blue areas, like the Netherlands and the UK, for example, you see that this is a very individualistic uh, culture. And this really has a huge effect on how you see yourself and your own personal characteristics. And you also see this coming back, this issue, uh, throughout uh, this uh, lecture. Okay, so we have a sense of who we are, and this is captured in our self-concept. But how do we develop this self-concept? 
So there's four different sources uh, of where our, our idea of who we are stem from. We have introspection, self-perception, social comparison, and feedback from others. And I'll walk you through each uh, of these uh, four different sources of uh, self-concept. First of all, introspection. And with introspection, we refer to the process where people look inwards and examine their own thoughts, feelings, and motives. So the moment that you're thinking to yourselves, who am I? Why did I do what I do? And why do I love what I love? And you try to start thinking, coming up with explanations for who you are. And that's important for us because we have, we have this very strong urge to understand ourselves. So we want to have an accurate view of who we are. And we sort of inspect ourselves, some more than others. But introspection is part of all, uh, for all human beings, that's part of who we are. Um, and we oftentimes have a lot of theories explaining our own behavior. However, a lot of the times, these theories are completely wrong. We have certain intuitions of why we do what we do, but they're often mistaken. We are using heuristics, for example, mental shortcuts in order to come to terms of, with who we are. We come up with explanations that seem logical, but are actually not the real cause of what is happening. And you'll see more and more examples of, of this in the upcoming lectures. But for now, just just keep in mind that introspection is not always helping us to really understand who we are because we are often underestimating situational circumstances that actually caused our behavior. So more about that later. So introspection is the first uh, source. Uh, then secondly, um, sometimes we don't have a very clear idea of who we are. And let's imagine that I ask you a question, do you like to cook? For some people, this will be a very straightforward question. They can immediately say, yes, I love to cook, or no, I hate cooking. But let's imagine you don't really know an immediate answer to the question. Maybe you lived at home your whole life and you never really engaged in cooking much, so you don't really know. What you can do, then do is uh, perceive your own behavior, uh, sort of reflect on how you behave. So you might think back of the time that you actually did cook. You might think back of the moment that you uh, baked an egg. And you thought to yourself, well, this was my endeavor to cook, so I tried to bake an egg, and it went terribly wrong. I, I really, it, it, was, it tasted disgusting, I burned the egg, and I hated this, this whole process. And then you think to yourself, well, I tried it out, I didn't like it, well, then I, no, I don't like cooking. So if you engage in a process like this, we call this self-perception. And with self-perception, you sort of derive your attitudes and your feelings um, from the behavior that you, sh that you uh, showed uh, earlier. So you look at past behavior and you start to sort of try to understand, do I like this, yes or no? Sounds a bit weird maybe, but that's oftentimes when, what people do if they feel ambiguous and they don't really know the answer. They start thinking back of moments when they show the behavior and think to themselves, did I like this, was I good at it, yes or no? So self-perception is the second source of uh, self-concept. And the third co uh, cause is uh, social comparison. And with social comparison, we mean that we learn uh, about our own skills and our own attitudes by comparing them to others. So we compare our own uh, uh, capacities to the capacities of other people. And we can do so in two different ways. We can use either upward social comparison or downward social comparison. Uh, and I'll show you, I'll, I'll illustrate this with an example. So let's imagine you uh, want to be, you know, uh, a little bit fitter. You want to, you know, engage in sports more. Maybe you want to lose a couple of kilos because you feel like you're not really uh, feeling your body uh, right now. So you want to go to the gym and, and work out and, and you, you want to have a sense of how am I doing that regard? Am I already, you know, close to reaching that goal of becoming fitter? So what you can then do is compare yourself to others around you. And you can go to the gym and compare yourself to this guy over here. Then you probably, I don't know what you look like, I don't see you, but I can imagine that you don't really have a body like this yet if you're wanna, wanting to work on, on, on your appearance. So if you compare your own state to the state uh, of the person you see in the screen now, you're uh, engaging in upward social comparison. You're comparing yourself to uh, another person that's actually excelling in this domain, is better than you in this domain. And um, if you do this, uh, this can be beneficial for you because it can lead to self-improvement. It can stimulate you and inspire you to also work out and become fitter and you know, maybe uh, at the end uh, look more like this guy over here. 
At the same time, it's important to keep in mind that it has to be realistic. So looking like this guy, even though you know some people might want to look at like this guy, some people really don't. Uh, but for a lot of people, this is really not you know uh, a, a realistic goal. So what can then happen is that you, if you compare yourself to someone that you uh, to a certain uh, person that has a status or a level of excellence that you can never reach, this can be really demotivating. So it has to be someone that is sort of within your level. Then it can motivate you to become better. So this is upward social comparison. You can also engage in downward social comparison. That is uh, maybe comparing you, yourself to a person that is, doesn't really care about that girl, goal and is not really you know, uh, interested in it, is not working towards that goal, also is clearly not succeeding at the goal of working out. Uh, and if you do that, um, then uh, the benefit uh, of that is that it's very good for your self-esteem. If you compare yourself uh, to someone that is you know, l is scoring lower than you on a certain domain, you feel good about yourself. Uh, the problem is that maybe if you compare yourself to this guy uh, lying on the couch, living his best life with his uh, Cheeto chips, then you might think to yourself, why on earth would I go to the gym? I can also just be like him. So you, can, you have to be a bit careful when using social comparison uh, if you want to uh, improve yourself. Um, okay, so then finally we can learn about our self-concept by getting feedback from others. Of course, sometimes in life we have competitions and you can win prizes. Uh, for, sometimes in school, for example, you can get your reports and you can really see how you did compared to the other kids in your classroom. Or maybe you engage in a certain sports competition, you run a marathon or you did uh, uh, some kind of competition and you win a prize. That, of course, also gives you feedback on who you are. Also, when you come in last, that also, of course, is informational uh, information on uh, what your skills are and maybe you're not so talented in that domain. So success and failure, that gives us information about our self-concept, but also just observing people, observing you. That can also be helpful. So that is when you are, for example, giving a presentation and your colleagues, you see them looking at you like with pride in their eyes and they give you compliments afterwards and they say to you, you really did a very good job there. So then you don't really win a prize, but you still see from the reactions, the responses of other people, how you did. So if you did really well, you sort of, you observe yourself from a meta perspective and you think to yourself, well, I did really well here. So um, this is probably something I, I can really do uh, very good. So I'm, I'm um, apparently good at giving presentations. Um, so feedback from others can actually stimulate us. It can help us to you know, feel more confident about ourselves or uh, it can inspire us to improve ourselves. But feedback from others can also backfire a little bit. And uh, for this, uh, to explain this, I want to go back to uh, lecture two in which I ask you to predict the outcome of the following situation. So remember the question, right? It was about a young boy, Taro, who happens to be my son. Uh, he's playing, this is a real life example, this actually happened. He was playing in his room. His room was a bit messy. That's, you know, sort of common uh, when you enter his room, it's a bit messy. Um, and um, from his own, you know, even without me interfering, Taro decided to clean up his room. And to his own surprise, he, was, he spent like half an hour, maybe uh, 45 minutes on, on cleaning up his room. And to his own surprise, he actually enjoyed that. He actually liked the act of cleaning up way more than he thought he would. And he liked the fact that his room was clean and he did this and he felt, you know, good about himself. Then later, his mother, me, entered the room and I decided to reward him with five euros. This last part is fictional. I didn't actually do this because, you know, I know psychology. So I didn't do this. But let's, let's you know, imagine that I rewarded Taro with five euros for the act, for this initiative of cleaning up his room. And the question to you in lecture two was, after this payment, do you think Taro will like the act of cleaning his, his room less, the same or more? And this is one of those sort of counterintuitive um, uh, phenomena in social psychology because you probably think to yourself, well, it would be logical Taro cleaned up his room, he liked it, and then he also got paid. So he probably likes it even more, right? But that's not how it works. And that has to do with his motivation. There's actually two types of motivations that people can have. We can be intrinsically motivated to do something or extrinsically motivated to do something. And if we have an intrinsic motivation, we engage in a certain activity because we like it, we enjoy it, and we find it, or we find it interesting. 
So this was actually what, what was happening with Taro. He liked the act of cleaning his room way more than anything. So he was intrinsically motivated to do so. If you do something from an extrinsic motivation, you engage in activity because there's external rewards or punishments if you don't do it. So that would be when I forced him to clean his room, otherwise he couldn't game anymore, or, he, you know, or I would reward him with five euros. So what is interesting is that feedback from other people can sometimes mess up this motivation, so the, the motivation that we have. So let's imagine a person like Taro is intrinsically motivated to do something, but then still gets a reward. So there's an external uh, 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 act, act, uh, action um, that changes his view. Um, if this happens, this, uh, then uh, this is called the over-justification effect. So Taro is paid for something that he initially already liked doing. So this is actually a situation in which we give out a reward, um, even though a person actually didn't need an, uh, a reward because the, the activity itself was already rewarding. And if you uh, add um, uh, an extrinsic motivation, an extra, extra, uh, external factor uh, to an act that is intrinsically uh, rewarding, then people can actually start liking it less. And that has to do with uh, how we perceive our actions. So. Um, Taro can think to himself, so I actually, uh, I, I cleaned up my room and after that I got paid to do so. Um, so why did I actually do it? Did I do it because of the payment or did I do it because I liked it? And this can really be sort of confusing to people. And uh, this is something we'll come back to extensively in uh, lecture six. So uh, if you don't really get it right now, it will, an uh, explanation will follow. So just keep in mind that, um, over-justifying, so giving rewards for something that is actually already rewarding, uh, works paradoxical and is actually, uh, you're not reaching uh, what you want to reach. So uh, this is uh, the end of this part, first part of the lecture.